let's give a warm welcome to our Rotary colleague, Patrick Calvin. Thank you very much, Peter. Boa tarde. Boa tarde, amigos brasileiros rotarianos. Um grande prazer estar com vocês. Good afternoon, all my other Rotary friends to be here. I appreciate your taking the time. Have you guys been enjoying the conference? Yes. You can answer in any language, it all works. <laughs> We're in the Tower of Babel here. I had very high expectations for this conference. This is my first Rotary International Conference, and I knew it would be great because everyone I know who's been to one of these said it would be a life-changing experience. And it has been. I have truly enjoyed all the sessions I've gone to. I've learned a lot of things that I know I can bring back to my club and help it grow. The social events have been a lot of fun. And what really stands out for me, though, more than anything else, are the people. The people I know who I've had, I, who I've had a chance to reconnect with, and all of the people I've met from countries from all over the world. It has been an amazing people experience. In fact, when I was thinking about what I was going to share with you in regards to fellowship, I was wondering if my people experience is similar to yours. So if you've run into me, chances are I've asked you this question. And every single person I've asked that question to has laughed at me. And I understand why. After the first day, I could not have answered this question. Just think about all the people you've met from all over the world, the many countries that they come from, the many jobs that they represent, the many things that they do. It has been an amazing experience, I think, for all of us. In fact, I think we could argue that we have been in the epicenter of fellowship in the world over the last few days. Fellowship is really what Rotary is about. And when we come to a convention like this, we have these wonderful opportunities that are created for us to build fellowship. But sometimes it's hard to engage in fellowship. We get back to our homes and our busy personal and professional lives, and it can be very difficult to find opportunities for fellowship. In fact, what we sometimes suffer from is something that the founder of our organization suffered from. Paul Harris, in 1900, 1900, was an extremely successful lawyer in Chicago, Illinois. Paul Harris had grown up in a small town in New England, one of these cheers-like places where everyone knows everyone else's name. And he arrives in the big city, he builds a highly successful law practice, but he feels alienated, disconnected. So one day, Paul Harris goes to the house of a friend, a guy named Bob Franks, they have a lovely dinner, and after dinner, Bob says, Paul, let's go for a walk. So they hit the streets of Chicago. Not quite as crowded as Sao Paulo, but still pretty busy. And what amazes Paul Harris is as he's walking around with his friend Bob, Bob is popping into stores and talking to merchants as if they're his friends. He's seeing clients, legal clients on the street, and talking to them as if they're his friends. And Paul Harris starts wondering, why am I not doing this? I've got a successful law practice, but I don't feel socially connected to the folks that work with me. So what does he do? He gets together with his buddies, these guys right here. These were clients of Paul Harris. They got together in 1905 and started talking about the need for fellowship, the need for more friendliness, and they decided to start the organization to which we all belong. Now, service came later. We're talking about the five core values in this series. Service actually came after fellowship. But all of these men were searching for points of connection. And that's what, gonna, that's what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon, is how we can all improve our connections in our clubs, in our communities, and in our careers. I knew when I first heard about Rotary that this was a group for me. I knew it. Because ever since I can remember, I've always been that sort of person that looks for opportunities to build connections. 
I just love meeting people. One of my very first memories happened when I was three years old. I remember sitting in the front window of my house, looking out on the driveway as my dad took my sister off to kindergarten for the very first time. And I remember this intense feeling of envy, knowing that she was going to be going to this new place, meeting all of these new kids, having, I didn't know it at the time, but all of these fellowship opportunities. And there I was, stuck at home with my mom. In fact, I loved being a student so much that when I finished my undergraduate program, I decided I didn't want to stop. I wanted to go to graduate school. But I couldn't pay for it. So where do you think I went? To Rotary. And thanks to Rotary, I ended up at this place, which is about 20 miles away from here, the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Tem algum piano por aqui? Alguma pessoa da Universidade de Sao Paulo? A couple of hands go up. This is a great university, and I had a lovely time in my one year here in Brazil. I was born in this country. I left when I was one year old. Didn't speak any Portuguese, really, when I got here. But thanks to Rotary, I learned a lot of Portuguese. I'm still working on it. And I had a chance to build fellowship with all of these Brazilian students. There are tens of thousands of alumni of Rotary scholarship programs that have had profound opportunities to build fellowship thanks to all of you and all of the other Rotarians at this convention. We provide, in the programs that we support, opportunities for people to build amazing fellowship. Today I want to talk about fellowship, and I want to just first qualify myself, because I think some of you are beginning to probably develop ideas about who I am. And I am an outlier. If there were a bell curve of connecting and fellowship, I'm the weirdo on the right side of that bell curve. I love connecting, but I understand the other side of the bell curve. I live with the other side of the bell curve. My wife, I love her dearly. She's not here. I'm not going to say anything bad about her. Everything about her is wonderful, but I would imagine that she shares many characteristics with many people like you. She oftentimes prefers a good book to going out and networking and engaging in fellowship. And that's perfectly fine. And it's always driven home to me time and time again how different we are. I remember a couple of years ago, I got invited to a networking event. We were both invited, an opportunity to build fellowship. And I look at the invitation. It looks great. No speaker. Always, always better when there's not a speaker. No speaker. Free food, free drink. I mean, what more could you want? Lots of networking. Sounds like the perfect event. And I hand this card to my wife. She goes over to her computer, calls up her calendar, and looks at it. And she smiles. She wasn't too happy about the networking thing. She smiles. I say, well, what is it? She goes, honey, you go to that networking thing. I've got something else going on. And she was smiling like it was this really great thing. And I said, well, what is it? And she said, it's a root canal. <laughs> a root canal. So the opportunity to go out and build fellowship or go have major work done on your teeth, that's way better in her eyes. Way better. So we want to talk about today how whether or not networking makes you want to have a root canal or go out and do more of it on how you can make it more effective and more fun. And before I get into that, I want to know where you stand. So this is a group that you've probably seen in the last few days, a group of strangers. When you look into a room and see something like that, are you thinking, I can hardly wait to get in there and meet people? Raise your hand if you're in that group. You can hardly wait to go in there and engage people. Well, this is proving to be true. OK, how many of you are thinking, I'd rather get a root canal? <laughs> you, no, says, this is honest. This is totally honest. And actually, if you look at the numbers, only about 10 to 20% of all people really like to go out there and connect with strangers. And the vast majority, though, do it because they have to. It's a personal obligation. They do it because they're a rotary officer, <laughs> something that they have to do. But they don't naturally love it. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, he's going to say, we just have to channel our inner extrovert and throw ourselves out there in the world. I'm not going to say that. In fact, if you're an introvert, you have a real advantage when it comes to connecting. You have a real advantage when it comes to building fellowship. The reason why is you are more intentional about it. You also tend to listen a lot more. And as we've heard in this convention, it's always better to listen than talk. My mom always said, we have two ears and one mouth, and we should use them in proportion. I forget that. But networking is something that we can learn. Fellowship is something that we can learn and we can get better at. It doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert. The funny thing, though, the funny thing, though is that we don't learn it in school. 
I have an MBA, my wife has an MBA, I know a lot of people have studied business. The most important part of business is building of relationships, but they don't teach us that in business school. So my hope today is I can share some things with you that you can put into practice in your clubs and in your careers. We have great role models at our clubs on how to build fellowship, how to build connections. This is a picture I took a couple weeks ago at my Rotary Club. The gentleman on the left is our best connector. He's the best person we have for developing fellowship. So I said, hey, Mike, I'm going to Brazil. What should I share from your wisdom about building fellowship? And he says, well, the first thing I do is he goes, I always have my antenna up. Because if we're going to be a successful club, we have to continue to attract new members. So I don't discriminate. When someone starts talking about community service, when someone expresses an exciting career or an interest in meeting others, I just invite them to lunch. That's all I do. And I follow up. I call them if they didn't show up when they told me they would. And he goes, I look at membership and I look at fellowship as a little bit like I looked at dating. It's a numbers game. You just keep asking and some people are going to say yes. So he's very good at that. But the other thing he does to build fellowship that many of us forget to do is when he meets that person, he learns something about them. He learns what they're looking to do, be it community service, be it career advancement. And when they show up at our club, he makes a concerted effort to introduce those people to folks at our club who might be of interest to them. And I would argue that that's probably why more people that he invites become members than anyone else, because he's thinking about how he can serve others. We have learned at our club, where I've served as membership engagement chair this year and membership recruitment chair last year, that there are some practices that a Rotary Club should have to build fellowship. And I would group them in two categories. The first are the informal ways we can encourage fellowship. So this is a picture that I took a couple weeks ago. We had a mystery dinner night. What we did is we got everyone together at a local bar right near the downtown area that we meet on a regular basis. And we had a happy hour for an hour. Then I took off my hat that you see in that picture. And everyone put their name in it. And we drew the names out in groups of six to eight. And randomly then, we went out into the city and enjoyed meals in small groups. Now, that doesn't sound like big stuff to you, but it, it was for many of our members. Many people in our club, and I'm sure it doesn't happen anywhere else, tend to sit with the same people at lunch. Does it happen? Yeah. So what we were doing was we were forcing people to get a little bit out of their comfort zone and engage with people they might not engage with. A very, very easy thing to do, and I wasn't sure how it was going to go. I thought people were pretty set in their ways, and already folks are saying, When's our next event going to be? We want to do another one of these. So it's always good to stretch and find ways to allow people to connect on an informal basis. One of our members has a wonderful model train set. And our seven-year-old daughter is excited to go over to this guy's house because every Christmas you can go see his model trains running around and enjoy some Christmas drinks and food. It's a wonderful informal opportunity to break away from luncheon tables and meet one-on-one. -on -one. Another member in our club is a geologist. He's an expert in wine. And we do events. Oregon has great wine country. I was paid to say that by the Oregon Tourism Board. Oregon has great wine country. And this geologist takes us out there. And we have a chance to drink wine and um, experience one another in a more informal setting. So what can you do on an informal basis to build fellowship at your club? I have been so excited that this convention is I've learned a whole new aspect of Rotary that I didn't know anything about. How many of you belong to one of the formal Rotary fellowship groups? Just raise your hand. There are 64 of these. Not that many people. I'd say about 15, 20% of the room. There are 64 organizations within the Rotary world that are officially approved by Rotary. And to be approved, you have to operate this fellowship group with members from more than three different countries. And you could just see some of the different areas out there. If you've walked in the House of Friendship, you've seen some of these fellowship groups. It's really cool. I knew nothing about this. I've been in Rotary now for three years. I'm learning about these groups here in Sao Paulo. And this is a wonderful way to have people being excited about being Rotarians because they, connect, they, they can connect with people who have recreational or vocational interests that are similar. 
So if you haven't had the chance to go out there and talk to folks representing these fellowship groups, you should. The first people you might talk to are the folks at the Esperanto Fellowship, which is Rotary's very first, started in 1928 to promote Esperanto. I was very interested in talking to people at the International Travel and Hosting Fellowship. Did you know that as a Rotarian, if you join the International Travel and Hosting Fellowship, $75 for three years membership, you can travel around the world visiting and staying with Rotarians for absolutely nothing, learning about these cultures and countries. I mean, how cool is that? That is such a great program. We're gonna start an international travel club in our chapter, in our, in our club, and we're gonna actually get people together on a quarterly basis to talk about travel experiences. And I'm gonna encourage people in our little travel group to join the International Travel and Hosting Fellowship. So I, for me, this is one of the most exciting things about the convention so far. When it comes to building fellowship, I've talked about things you can do informally at, at the club level and things that you can do formally. What are you doing? What are you doing at your club to build fellowship? Now, if I were to stand up here for the next hour and just talk to you in a fellowship breakout session, I think I could be accused of malpractice. I don't want to suffer that consequence. So what I'd like you to do is if you've come here with someone you know, wonderful, but don't talk to them, at least not right now. What I would like you to do is talk to somebody next to you and share with them one of the best practices from your club on how you build fellowship either in, a, in an informal way or a formal way. I'm gonna take about five minutes for this, and then I'm gonna start jumping up and down and doing jumping jacks to get your attention, to get back into the presentation. But in the spirit of fellowship, introduce yourself, introduce your club, your country, and share a fellowship best practice, either informal or formal, that you are doing at your Rotary Club. So, five minutes. Thank you very much, and I hope you got some great ideas on how you can build fellowship at the club level, both informally and formally. Did anyone have a really cool idea that they just can't wait to share? A really cool fellowship idea? Any hands? Wow, you guys are all talking. That's okay. I'm going to come back to you in just a little bit for ideas in a bit. But there is very much that we can do on the club level to build fellowship, but I want to focus on things that we can do on the individual level. And I want to talk about two things in the time that remains to me today, that things that we can do in the physical world as well as things that we can do in the online world to build connections and build fellowship. Now, I shared the story of Mike Sandoval, gentleman in my club who I think is a really good connector, and I've been watching him and seeing another thing that he does. And this is a little strategy that I've uh, worked on, seeing him do this so effectively on building fellowship. He always looks for somebody at our club who has the guest tag and is standing back in the corner of the room not talking to somebody. I think I'm a member of a big club. We've got 270 members or so in our club. And it's very easy for people to get lost in the shuffle. So watching Mike, I've learned that one of the best ways I can build fellowship and to make a guest feel like we are a fellowship group is to go up and talk to that person and welcome them and make them feel like I'm glad they're there and introduce that person to somebody who I think they would be interested in or to sit and have lunch with that person. It's that individual stuff that we sometimes forget about and today at this Rotary Convention, I learned that there was somebody who visited our club who ended up joining another Rotary Club in our district because they didn't feel fellowship from our members. And that makes me feel very sad that that took place. So it is upon us as Rotarians to always think about ways that we can develop fellowship because by not doing it, by not making people feel included, we might be losing out on the next best Rotarian. So I'm always looking for ways that I can improve my fellowship building skills. And I wanna share with you some lessons I've learned from a very unconventional guru on fellowship very unconventional, so you're gonna have to kind of bear with me here. My guru on fellowship is my dog. That's my dog, Bella the Boxer. Any boxer owners out there? Yeah, good. You're gonna to relate to these pictures. So, any, how many dog owners out there, just out of curiosity? 
Good. I'd say about 35%. So you're my people. And the rest of you, I think this is going to make sense if you just bear with me a little bit here. So Bella the Boxer is the director of goodwill. You can do the little abbreviation thing of, of my company, the Galvanizing Group. And she is amazing at building fellowship. In fact, she wrote a book about connecting and about doing business and about how we can work better and live happier if we live like our dogs. She's got a whole chapter in the book about connecting, about fellowship ideas. And I wanted to share with you what I think are some of the top ideas, not only from Bella, but from all of the dogs in our lives. So for you boxer owner out there, you could relate to this. The tongue of a boxer is very disproportional to the size of the dog. The tongue of the boxer is about six feet long, and they like to wrap it around your neck. Now, you may be wondering, where is this guy going with this presentation? This is beginning to feel kind of scary. Don't do that at your next Rotary meeting with a guest. They may not like it. But what you can do is you can embrace that spirit, that welcoming spirit that I was talking about earlier. It's introducing somebody into the club with enthusiasm, making them feel welcome. And we can learn that lesson from our dogs because aren't they always enthusiastic when we come home at the end of the day? If you want a friend, get a dog. The other thing that Bella is really good at is helping others get what they want. That little pug comes over to our house often, which is very unusual in the life of that pug. That is an antisocial pug. That pug doesn't like to come out very often. The reason why Yeti the pug comes to our house is that Bella will grab that pink squeaky toy and bring it to Yeti and just drop it at his feet. And they'll wrestle and they'll tussle. Bella, Bella's getting what she wants. She wants to have fun. But she is doing it by pleasing the other. There's a speaker named Zig Ziglar who said, you can get anything you want in life by helping others get what they want. I mean, so often as Rotarians, we think this way, and it's a good thing. If we introduce people around our club, we make them feel welcome. Well, chances are they're going to want to be part of our club. And really, from a business standpoint, if you want people to want to do business with you, instead of thinking about how you can get them to be a client, think about how you can give to them, give them a lead, give them some information, give them a way to grow, and they're going to want to be with you, be that in your club or with your company. How many of you read dog body language? Any experts out there? Does Bella look happy? This was at a yappy hour, a yappy hour. So this, is, this might be a very culturally um, weird thing for the folks who aren't from the United States, or maybe even weird from anyone from the United States who doesn't happen to live in Portland, Oregon. But in Portland, Oregon, we have yappy hours. Not happy hours, but yappy hours. Yappy hours. And the doggy daycare centers sponsor these events where dog folks get together with their dogs and other dog people. And a chance, it's a chance for you to see this dog business. And uh, you can network with people there. And your dogs are playing on the yard. It's a lot of fun. Well, we went to this event. And that little white terrier was coming on really strong to Bella. Not in an aggressive way, but kind of grabbing her cheeks, trying to get her attention. And if you read doggy body, body language, she's not happy. The bristles on her hair are, are up. Her legs are stiff. She doesn't want to be there. She is not happy to be there. This happens all the time in the real world. You've probably seen these people at your Rotary Club. I call them the blackjack dealers. They're the folks who come to your Rotary meeting with a stack of business cards, and they start working the room. Hey, nice to meet you, nice to meet you, nice to meet you, nice to meet you, nice to meet you. You know these people. I met a lady at our club who said, it was an awesome meeting. I said, why? She said, I passed out 20 business cards. She was a guest. I said, wow, that's really great. I went outside the meeting, what did I find? About 15 business cards in the garbage. <laughs> it's not a numbers game, it's about building relationships and building connections, and that takes time. So if you're at a Rotary meeting and you only talk to one guest, that's fine. If you have a real deep conversation with one guest, that's much better than working the room and talking to 10 people very superficially. So for you intro introverts out there, you can breathe a sigh of relief. It's not about meeting lots of people, it's about meeting people in an authentic way, taking time to get to know them. If you saw Bella in Portland in one of our oodles of dog parks that lie around our city, chances are you're going to see her with her tongue sticking out and this pack of dogs is going to be chasing after her. She might have a stick in her mouth. She might have a ball in her mouth. She loves being a leader. 
for Bella, life is about joy. And she knows that being a leader is a very joyful experience. Why is it not joyful in the Rotary world? Why do we sometimes struggle to get people into positions of leadership? I think it's a lot of fun being a leader. It takes a little bit more work. In our club, it just means showing up an hour before our regular meeting once a month and being on a committee. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it makes all the difference in the world. If you're a leader, if you get people in your clubs to be leaders and engage in that aspect of fellowship, they're going to stick around. They're going to be Rotarians for the long haul. And you know what? It's also going to be good for their businesses because people do business with folks who they know and like. And if you step into leadership in Rotary and people get to know you, they're going to want to get to know you in many ways, personal and professional. So when you're pitching leadership to prospects in your club who don't want to do it, it's important to let them know that it'll be good for Rotary and it's going to be good for them. Those of us who think we train our dogs are very mistaken. Our dogs train us. Our dogs train us. So when Bella does that, I know what I'm supposed to do. I have been trained to go over and rub her belly, and when I do that, I'm going to see her head and tail at the exact same time, and they're going to both be wagging. It's this crazy thing that boxers do called the kidney bean. Now, Bella has taught me that if she wants to get what she wants, she needs to send me signs. If we are being a good leader, if we are taking time to get to know people, if we are helping others, you might think that's enough to attract people to you, to attract people to your business, to your Rotary Club, what have you. But I've learned that you have to ask. If you want your members to bring people into the fellowship of your club, it's essential that you let them know that they need to ask people. In our club, once, once a year for a month, we ask Rotarians to invite a friend to lunch. And we, as the club, pay for that lunch. And all of a sudden, what happens? We have all these people showing up. We have people showing up throughout the year, but in that one month, we have far more visitors than we ever have. Why? Because for that one month, we planted the seed in people's minds that they need to ask for people to come to our club or ask them to refer people to come to our club. By the way, this same thing works in business, and I wanted to share a takeaway idea that you can bring back to your businesses because most of us are in business. It's very true in business. One of the questions I was asked more than any other question when I started my public relations company is, Patrick, why are we not getting more referrals for our business? And I didn't think of the obvious answer. I didn't have a good answer. And then I went to a word of mouth marketing association conference and a professor from Northeastern University got up and he shared this very interesting statistic. He said that 50% of all people in order to make a referral must be asked. And the reason why that's the case, he said, is there's this paradox. If you are doing well in your company and you're not asking for referrals, and you can apply this to the Rotary world as well. If you have a great club and you're not asking for referrals for new members, for people to suggest people who might be good members, what are people going to think? They're going to think that you're so successful that you don't need to grow. So successful, and I thought, wow, that is just way too obvious. I have an MBA. I'm smarter than that. That's too basic. I came back from that conference and for one quarter, I started asking for referrals for my business. In that 90-day period, I had more referrals for business than I had ever had before, simply from having the conversation. Simply from having the conversation. So if you go back and you start having this conversation, you'll be amazed at what you'll find. When I went and started asking people for referrals, I heard, look, I didn't know you look, were looking to grow. If you start asking people in your community to come join your club, to join your fellowship, I bet you a lot of people are going to say, wow, thank you. I didn't know you were looking to grow. So asking for referrals is such an important part of fellowship, and it is so often forgotten. One reason why people don't do it is they say, well, you're an extrovert. It's easy for you to have that conversation. It's easy for you. You, you're, you just like to talk. And they're right. I do. But what's also true is that when you ask for a referral, be it for Rotary or be it for your business, if you ask in a certain way, it's very easy to do. If you tell someone, look, I would love to have you come to our club. I think you would find it interesting. Even if they're not interested, they're going to feel flattered that you asked. So why wouldn't you ask everyone you knew to come join the fellowship of your Rotary Club? Why wouldn't you go to your best clients and tell them, look, I have a lot of clients, but boy, my life would be so much better if I had more clients like you. Imagine how that would make them feel. So even if they don't do business with you, even if they don't come to your club, 
you're elevating them. You're making them feel important. So there's a lot of things that we can learn from our dogs. And there's a lot of things that I think you all know when it comes to building relationships and connecting. Now, I want to jump into some of the things we can do in the online world to build fellowships and connections as Rotarians. But before doing that, I would love to hear any success stories that any of you have in building fellowships. So I've got a microphone here, and I think there's going to be another one floating around on that side of the room. The question is, how do you build connections? How do you make people feel like they want to be with you, be with your club, be with your business? Any best practices or ideas that anyone would like to share? That side of the room? OK. And if you wouldn't mind just standing up and introducing yourself and your club and your country. Olá, boa tarde. Meu nome é Luiz Carlos Cardoso. I'll translate Eu for him. Eu sou do Maranhão, na capital São Luís. O meu clube é São Luís João Paulo. Lá nós usamos as redes sociais para identificar e celebrar o aniversário de cada rotariano e todos os demais é, acabam por valorizar aquele dia. Mais uma coisa? E, além disso, somos cinco clubes na capital, em São Luís. E, uma vez por mês, nós fazemos uma reunião conjunta e nos senti sentamos em lugares diferentes e compartilhamos com pessoas diferentes. Muito obrigado. So our friend uh, from San Luis Maranhão had a couple of ideas. Uh, his first is they celebrate, they use social media, and they celebrate people's anniversaries on social media, birthdays, and it makes people feel very special. Also, in San Luis, there are five Rotary Clubs. This is in the northeastern part of Brazil. And they actually meet together on a rotational basis so they can get to know each other and really build some solidarity around Rotary in their region in Brazil. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Uh, sir, just introduce yourself and your fellowship idea. Um, it's a boy in a case. My name from Rotary Club of Agbo, District 9140, Nigeria. Of the best practice we do in our club is using social media to inform members of what is going on in the club. Um, apart from the club, especially when we have uh, our projects, when we want to commission projects, we use the social media to invite our friends to attend, for example, the Rotary Club of Agbo sang water for hearing impaired and mute with a matching grant project with uh, Rotary Club of Lincoln City, United States. And we sent a mail through the media to all the community leaders. Very good. So with that, we were able to invite people to join our clubs. Thank you very much. So we're going to get into the social media. I'm glad people are using it. We're going to be talking about some ideas. Of course, you're at the very corner, right? I can send a microphone your way, and if you can share your best practice. Thank you. Uh, in the very back of the room, very back of the room, gentlemen in the very back. Hi. Um, Manuel Tramchandani, assistant governor from the beautiful island of Jamaica. So we have a, a couple of things that I think are success stories for us. One of them is that uh, we have a family of Rotary chair in the club, and part of what they do every week, as mentioned earlier, they, they talk about anybody who celebrated uh, birthdays and anniversaries, but also we, at the same time, we do happy and sad moments for the members. And, you know, just that small one minute someone shares, oh, you know, their kid just did this this week, or someone have a, has a sad moment and all that really kind of creates that personal connection that I think works very well for us. Thank you. Another thing that, um, that works fantastic is we do a classification talk that I think really every club should engage in. It works so well for us. For new members coming in, generally off the bat, we put them up for a classification talk and so that they feel a lot more connected even though they're the ones talking and the members are the ones learning about them but they feel a lot better that they got a chance it really to talk raises about them up, it sounds who, like. who they are. Yeah. And it works great. But even for senior members who've been there for a while, you realize when your, your colleague does a classification talk that really there was a lot that you didn't know about them and it, it really opens up a whole new avenue. So we generally ask them to do who you are, tell us a little bit about your history, your, your life, and 
how can we benefit from you? Great. And so we go back to that, that you know, early vocational aspect thank, of Rotary. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more. There's a gentleman on this side who was raising his hand. Why don't we go to him and then we'll continue on here. Your name and your club, please. Um, my name is Bill Mathis. I'm the president-elect of our club and we're in Central California. It's Visalia, California. I have several stories. Uh, you know, the story you talked about, somebody sitting in the corner and inviting them in. I, I did that with one of our new members and it was interesting to me that she came to me later and said how much that meant to her. I also, a, a new club member came into our club just uh, within the last five or six weeks. And I was standing there and I, you know, I, I, the one thing I've always tried to do in our club, and I've charged our board of directors with the same thing, was to make sure that they introduce themselves to all of the new club members. But I have always made a point of bringing people in and going over to them and shaking their hand and telling them how much I appreciate their participation. The one club member I was talking about, I was standing there and I was talking to him. I think he had been to about four or five meetings and he walked in and he, he handed me a medal and it was a, it, he works for the Visalia Police Department, he handed me a medal he said, we only give out a few of these. He said, but you have made me feel so welcome in this club. I need to give this to you. That's great. That meant a great that, deal. That means a lot. Thank you very much for sharing. And I know there's a lot of other good ideas out there that I didn't have a chance to call on everybody. My hope is that this session encourages more fellowship and that you're able to share some of these ideas for what you're doing in the real world to build fellowship. And I don't have a lot of time, and there's a lot I wanted to touch on today. And Many people told me, well, can you talk a little bit about social media, what you're doing at your club, what you do individually to build fellowship? And I thought that that is something that we should all talk about. Uh, it's fun talking about social media when it comes to fellowship because I think there's a wonderful tool out there that's not being used enough, uh, that's very easy to use. And um, the, the tool is LinkedIn, uh, and it's been around for a while. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have a LinkedIn profile? Just raise your hands. Look at that, about 70% 70 of, of the room, I'd say. Uh, LinkedIn is fun for me to talk about as a speaker as a way to build fellowship and connection because there used to be all these other platforms that I'd have to talk about, and none of them are really strong anymore. If we as Rotarians just embrace this one platform, there is a lot that we can do to build fellowship on the club level as well as on an individual basis. I mean, if you look at the numbers for this platform, it's not just a US phenomenon. It's a worldwide one. It's very strong in the United States, but really if you look at LinkedIn, where it's seeing its growth is really more on the international level. Uh, it's now available in 200 different countries, which as far as I know is everywhere in the world. It's available in 20 different languages. 70% of the users out, are outside the United States. And the most interesting statistic, and this just came out, is that 50% of all LinkedIn users are saying they're spending two hours on the platform a week or more. That's an amazing number to me. And if you look at that and think, oh my gosh, there's no way I'm ever gonna spend two hours on LinkedIn. Well, I'm with you, I don't spend two hours on LinkedIn. And it's very useful for me as a Rotarian, it's very useful in my career. And I wanna share with you how LinkedIn can be a very valuable tool for yourselves. I was talking to a guy, a client, and I, I was saying, well, you know, you really have to have a good LinkedIn presence. And he says, I'm not interested in LinkedIn. I don't really care. I don't check my profile or anything like that. And I said, well, why don't you just Google yourself? And I'm not paid to say Google in this presentation, but the reality is 70% of all search in the world right now is being done on Google. If you Google yourself and your company name, very good chance that the first or second thing that will come up on LinkedIn, will, that will come up in search is LinkedIn. It did in the case of this gentleman. It'll probably come up if you do it now. I know some of you have your smartphones out and you got your laptops, just try it. You'll see that LinkedIn is gonna probably appear number one or number two. So you've crafted this great biography. You meet somebody at a Rotary event. They say, who was this person who talked to me? Wow, that is a really cool person. Maybe I wanna join Rotary. Maybe I wanna do business with that person. What are they gonna do? They're gonna go to Google. And they're gonna wanna find out about you. They're gonna type in your name and your company and in number one, number two, maybe even in both places, they're gonna get your LinkedIn profile. Are you happy with what they see when they go to LinkedIn? Are you happy, are you proud of your LinkedIn profile? Uh, well, that's something we're gonna be looking at here. Why am I kind of beating this drum of LinkedIn? Well, this is something I think a lot of people don't think about. You think, well, who am I connected to on LinkedIn? And what does it matter? Well, I'm gonna use myself, I'm gonna pick on myself here as an example. 
In my first degree on LinkedIn, I have 730 people that are connected to me, 730. But they connect me to another 478,000 people. That means there are 478,000 people in the world who I can get a personal introduction to from the 730 people I know. Most of you are like that. If you have around that number of connections, you're talking hundreds and thousands in your second degree. And you go out to the third degree, and you're getting into the tens of millions. Tens of millions. Now, this is very powerful for us as Rotarians. Why? Well, let's say you knew of a company in your area that you wanted to bring into the fellowship of your club. How are you going to do that? Well, instead of going to Google and trying to figure out if you know someone at that company, I'd encourage you to go to LinkedIn. And what you do is you enter in the name of that company. You got the company information on the left, but you have a little box there on the right. I've highlighted it in blue. And in that blue box, you're going to see who you're connected to at that company. So this is a big real estate company in the United States. I entered them in, and I see that I don't know anyone at that real estate company. But there are 345 people out of the 38,000 employees who work for that company who know people that I know. So let's say you wanted a big company in your Rotary Club, but you don't have a connection. You don't think you have a connection. You might be very surprised to discover that there is somebody you know or there's someone in your club who knows somebody at that company who would make a good Rotarian. So you can click on that box, and all of a sudden you have this list of those second-degree connections. And I can go through and I can search that list by job title. I can search it by geography. There's all these different things I can do with it. And I'll see every one of those people on that list will have how many connections we share. It's where that blue arrow is. I click on that, and all of a sudden, I see three names of people I know very well. So for me, I only connect to people on LinkedIn who I really know. And now what I can do is I can go through and I can find a person at that company who I want to have join our club. I can click, and I can discover that there are three people I know who could introduce me to a very specific person at that company. And I've done this a number of times. I've done it for Rotary, and I've done this actually a lot more in my professional endeavors. All of a sudden, what do you think happens? Instead of me making a cold call saying, hey, come join the Fellowship of Rotary, or I might like to do business with you, all of a sudden, I'm reaching out to one of the people I know saying, hey, I see you know Lynn at Keller Williams. I'd love to talk to him. They're going to say, hey, I'd be happy to introduce you. They'll pick up the phone. They'll send an email on my behalf. Not only will I be introduced, but I'll be recommended at the same time. I mean, this is a dramatic change in the way that we can network and connect with people. This is incredibly powerful. I have 730 people in my first degree network. Last year, I had five requests for introduction. Five. How many requests have you had? People are not using this tool enough. If you want to grow the fellowship of your Rotary Club, tap into the power of this thing that now allows you to know who knows the people who you want to connect with? The key is, if you start using LinkedIn, you want to put your best foot forward. Uh, you want to put your best foot forward. Now, I can't make you a, an all-star in the NBA. I can't get you on the Sila Sound Brasileira Futebol. I can't do those things for you, but I can make you an all-star on LinkedIn. In fact, I won't do it for you. LinkedIn will do it for you. So if you go into LinkedIn, and you go into the edit mode on your profile, there's this little blue ball. And you want that ball to be full, all the way up to the top. And all you have to do is follow the prompts. If you leave this session, go back to your hotels tonight, you can spend an hour or two, if you've got a big resume, on LinkedIn, and you can quickly become an all-star. And when you become an all-star, then you could really start using this tool effectively. The way you do it is you just start answering the questions that they're going to start popping up on your screen. What you want to do is you want to put a human face on who you are on LinkedIn. Most people don't have a profile that looks like this with a nice summary statement. A lot of people don't have pictures on LinkedIn. Uh, you want to make sure you have a picture. People want to, want to look into the eyes of someone they want to do business with. But have a summary statement that really gives people a sense of who you are. If you're committed to Rotary and it, it's a big part of your life, you want to have that in your summary statement. You want to share things on a personal level that talk about your integrity, some of the values we've been talking about over the last couple of days, that talk about your core sort of business capacities and interests, as well as how you do things. So it should be very personal. 
And then there should be a paragraph about your company and about your interests. It doesn't need to be long. This is someone that I worked with a couple months ago, and she is the only real estate loan officer in our municipality that really has a great LinkedIn summary statement. When you read about her passion for mortgage lending, you really think she cares, because she does. She's been doing it for 32 years. You can read in her profile that she cares about the community, and it's demonstrated in what she wrote here. You can read about the belief that she has in her employer, who she's stuck with for 32 years. I mean, doesn't this stand out from most of the profiles you see that just look like resumes? Wouldn't you want to pick up the phone and talk to that person? So if you are using LinkedIn, be it for rotary purposes or professional purposes, consider giving it a little reworking and make sure that you have a summary statement that really humanizes you and shows people the professional that you are. Think about video. If you go to my LinkedIn profile, I've got a little two minute video on it. There are more people who click on my video from LinkedIn than from YouTube or anywhere else. You can hire a young videography student to come into your company or come into your rotary club. This would be a cool member, member benefit. Have people come into your club and shoot little one to two minute videos where people are talking about the passion they have for what they do. And maybe they should put in a little plug about radio, uh, rotary in there too, why not? One to two minutes is all you need. You can upload it to LinkedIn, it doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to pay a dime for this. If you're the only professional in your city, in your state, in your country that has video, imagine how you're gonna stand apart from all the others who are just random names. When people hear about you, they're probably gonna be out there looking around, maybe at other Rotary Clubs, maybe for other professionals who do what you do. So they're gonna be shopping around. Wouldn't it be dramatic if they could actually see you talking? I got called last year by somebody who saw me talking from Slovenia. I didn't even know where the country was. And they invited me to come speak there because they watched the video. So video makes a big difference. It's also a great way to highlight your commitment to Rotary and the fellowship that you're looking to build within Rotary. There's a section on LinkedIn called Volunteer Experiences and Causes. You should have your positions there. Uh, describe what you do, how long you've served in those different capacities. You should have a connection to your Rotary group. Now, if you don't have a Rotary group for your club, I'll show you in just a bit what that should look like. But it is a very important way for you to put Rotary front and center. One of the things you want to make sure that you do on LinkedIn is let other people sing your praises. If you've served on the board and there are other people who have served with you, they would be happy to write a recommendation on your behalf. If you've done good work for a client, instead of just nodding your head when someone says, hey, you did a great job for us or you have a wonderful product, why not say to that person, well, thank you very much. I'm looking to grow my company. I'm looking for referrals, kind of going back to what I said, would you mind sharing on LinkedIn what you just shared with me? All of a sudden, this really great thing they said about you, which makes you feel good, is gonna live forever on LinkedIn. This will get you business, this will get you more people interested in your Rotary Club when you have people sharing stories. I mean, think about the way Hollywood sells movies. They have the best copywriters in the world in Hollywood, but there is nothing as powerful as a testimonial someone singing your praises. And LinkedIn offers the best platform for that. So if you start collecting these on LinkedIn, then you can start sharing them on your websites. It's a wonderful way to grow your word of mouth and to bring people into the fellowship of your club. If you take LinkedIn seriously, and I encourage you to, hopefully I've made a good argument for it, start thinking about how you can leverage it. So if you go into Google, you can type in LinkedIn badge, and that little thing you see in the bottom of my email signature next to the blue line, you can add that to your profile. And now when you send out an email, people can click and they can see your commitment to Rotary. They can see your commitment to your profession, to your employer, what have you. They can see the recommendations that you have because it's all there on a profile. And LinkedIn is seen as much more legitimate than anything you're gonna post on your website. So hopefully you start thinking about this as a tool that you can use to build your business, to attract more people into the universe of your Rotary Club as well. Another cool thing you can do on LinkedIn is you can share your passion for Rotary. I went onto LinkedIn a couple weeks ago as I prepared this presentation and just typed in Rotary to see what I, what I would find. And there were all these articles that started popping up. Uh, this is a gentleman from Michigan. Uh, he's a young Rotarian and he wrote a short little essay, about 300 words, on why he's proud to be a millennial Rotarian. I mean, aren't we all looking for younger Rotarians? 
Well, this guy is singing the praises of Rotary unsolicited, and he shared this on this platform called Pulse, which is very easy to use. If you can type a document on your computer in Word, uh, you can actually create a post like this in about 10 minutes. And within minutes of sharing this, 183 people in his network and in his second degree network saw it, 12 people liked it, and about four people commented. And he got people engaged in, in Rotary. He started a little fellowship online. So if everyone in your club once a year just posted something about Rotary, imagine how that might help grow the fellowship of your club. This is our club's Rotary group page. It doesn't cost anything to create this. Uh, just recently, one of our members went online. We had the mayor of our city speak at our club. Our meetings are very tight, so when our speaker finishes, everyone is rushing out to go back to work. But one guy who's a general manager for a hotel went on after the speech, went on to our group page and said, wow, that was a great presentation. And I commented on it, um, another member commented on it, and then Terry commented back. So all of a sudden you have an online platform that allows you to build upon the fellowship that you're creating in the real world. And I think that's really the power of social media, and it's a very valuable thing to, uh, to use LinkedIn for. Just out of curiosity, how many Rotary clubs out there, how many of you are using group pages on LinkedIn? Just a small handful. So this is a real, I saw about 10 hands go up. So this is a real opportunity to grow your fellowship by plugging in and creating a page like this. So whenever I talk about social media, be it LinkedIn or other forms of social media, the question I'm most often asked is, well, is it about having a really big network? I don't have a really big network. You know, you have to rush out and get a lot of people. I would say don't do that. Um, you want to make sure that the folks in your network are people who you really think could stand by you, who know you well enough to recommend you, and they're people who you would feel confident recommending. That's at least is my criteria. Uh, it's not about having this really gigantic network of names and faces that you don't know, but people who are really important to you. That said, have you ever cross-checked your Rotary Club's membership list with the people you're connected to online, be it on LinkedIn or Facebook? How many of you have done that? Very few hands go up. So let's say you have two or 300 connections on LinkedIn. From what I polled here, about 70% of you are on LinkedIn. Just imagine all of the quality connections you could add to your LinkedIn network if you just took out your membership directory and cross-checked it against who you're already connected to on LinkedIn. And you could do the same on Facebook or other social media platforms that are significant in your countries. All of a sudden then you're starting to develop a social network that is really a relevant one. Not just names and faces, but people who you're connected to because we just don't see people enough. As much as we do things in the real world, as much as we go to Rotary every week, it's not enough to stay top of mind. Connect to people online and you're going to be remembered much more. It's going to help you grow your club and grow your business as well. LinkedIn is a very powerful tool to follow up with, with new members to your club, guests to your club. This is a note that I sent out earlier this year to a woman who had just joined our Rotary Club. It took me all of about five minutes to write this note, probably not even that much. What do you notice about this note? It's personal. She's a great person. I'm glad to have her in our club, and I just wanted to share that. And because she's in our club, I'm looking forward to getting to know her better in the years to come, and I'd love her to be connected to my LinkedIn network. She not only accepted that, but the next club meeting, she said, thank you so much for sending that note. It made a real difference to me. The thing is, in the social media world, we don't get notes like this enough. Chances are you get a note along these lines. I'd like to add you to my professional network. How many of you have seen that? Yeah, doesn't that make you feel special? That's like, dear occupant, you're online, so am I, let's meet up. It doesn't work. Take time to use this tool to follow up with people you meet in Rotary. They will appreciate it online and they're gonna probably appreciate it offline as well. So I shared a statistic that people spend two hours a week on LinkedIn. 50% of, of all people spend two hours a week on it. I spend probably about 20 minutes a week on LinkedIn. Uh, but the best thing I do is I go onto LinkedIn and I take time to recommend people that I like. People in my club, people I do business with. If you adopt this as a best practice, once a week for five minutes, you go online, you find somebody in your online world who you have a lot of respect for, and you just write a simple note, a simple testimonial. 
boy, what happens? Well, I did this one. Within 15 minutes of recommending this realtor, I got a phone call. Wow, thank you for recommending me. You know, I've got lots of recommendations online, but you're the first person who's actually done one without me asking for it. So think about how you might be doing service above self for your fellow Rotarians. This is a great way to do it. Take time to recommend people who you really like and really trust. There's no better platform for doing this than LinkedIn. And you know, I did not do this as a quid pro quo, but very shortly after doing this, I got a great referral from this realtor. So what's good for Rotary, I think oftentimes is good for business. Because the four-way test, as we live it in Rotary and as we apply it in all of our lives, as well as on social media, it does work. LinkedIn also keys us in on milestones, and I know some Rotarians are doing this, which is great. They're sharing people's milestones on social media. We all get these notes from LinkedIn letting us know other milestones, when people are promoted, when they move to a new company, when they have a birthday. What do we do with this information that we all get? Well, we're busy, so I think most of us will probably just dump this into a, a junk mailbox, but why not take some time to look at this and recognize people? I love that these Rotary Clubs are recognizing birthdays. People love it. To love to know that folks care. The key to social media as a fellowship building tool is to link it back to your actions in the real world. So when someone has a milestone, when they have a promotion, when they move to a new company, when they have a birthday, pick up your phone. There is a voice feature on phones that still works. And say, hey, congratulations, 10 years with that company. How did they manage to hang on to you that long? Well, when you see that someone in your network is now going to be Rotary Club president, Pick, them up, pick up that phone and congratulate them. Send them a letter. Go real analog on them. They're going to be amazed. No one does this stuff anymore, but it really resonates. When you bring back what you're doing in the online world to what you do in the real world, I think that's really where fellowship possibilities are the strongest. There's a book that I would recommend. It's translated into all the languages I think represented here called Never Eat Alone uh, by a guy named Keith Ferrazzi. And in that book, he talks about the power of being a connector of your connections. So this is another way to take what we do in the digital world and bring it back to the real world. Rotary Club luncheons are a wonderful opportunity for all of us. Go on to LinkedIn, find two people you know that are not Rotarians, and invite them both to a club meeting. And pick two people that you think might be a good business connection for one another. They're going to love that you've introduced them to somebody who might be a good business partner for them. And maybe it works out on the business front for them. I hope it does. But if it doesn't, you've introduced two people to Rotary. So even if they don't do business with each other, they've had the experience of coming to a Rotary meeting. So instead of exposing one person to Rotary, you've exposed two people to Rotary. And you're building that fellowship. At the same time, you're helping other people build their businesses. I heard about some social media sharing, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, these are just a couple of, of examples of what we're doing in Portland. So our club has a Facebook page. Uh, we've got about, I think, about 700 people connected to it. Uh, our club president is here, and there's a picture of him with our outgoing president at our district conference. And I noticed that after that posted, about 12 members shared that. A couple of people commented. We found that Facebook is a great way to kind of build our fellowship because someone comes and visits our club, they may not come for a while, but if they get onto our Facebook page, they're aware of who we are and what we do. And we're encouraging our members to share. So there's a picture there on the right of an uh, amusement park, and my kid is in there. And she had a great time at this Rotary Family Day that we did. I posted that up onto Facebook and talked about my love for Rotary. Very short post. You can ask your members to do this. And within about an hour, 13 of my friends gave it the thumbs up. And I had a nice conversation with someone about Rotary based on that single that single post. So if you want to build fellowship, and if you want to grow the fellowship of your club, you need to get out the secret of what Rotary is all about. And social media, Facebook, is, I think, the best way to do it for a wider universe. So LinkedIn has 350 million users. Facebook is about 1.3 billion. One reason why people don't do social media, be it for Rotary or be it for their businesses, is they say that they don't have time. They could get scared by that statistic I shared so showing that people spend two hours uh, a week on LinkedIn. That's a lot of time. Social media could be like going down a rabbit hole. You can waste a lot of hours. <coughs> One of the best ways to use social media to build fellowship is to take time to do so. So I use this technique called the Pomodoro technique. I don't know if there's anyone from Italy out there. 
but a pomodoro in Italian means a tomato. In Italy, instead of having white kitchen timers like we have in the United States, they have these little red ones. And a sociologist in Italy came up with this great idea, and he wanted to deal with the fact that multitasking is a myth, and this has been proven in study after study, and he says when it comes to any task, and social media is a perfect one for this, just set that timer on your desk, and for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, just focus on that one task at hand. If it's LinkedIn, take time to connect with people in a one-on-one -on -one basis, invite them into your network, go through your membership list, invite them in, accept invitations to connect, share something on your, on your uh, Rotary Club's group page. If you do these little things, it's amazing how many you can fit into a 25 minute increment, a 20 minute increment, and then you can move on to your next task. There's no reason why you need to be on any social media platform for more than 20 minutes a week if you're using it for business purposes or rotary purposes. You just need to use it wisely. My final pitch for why you wanna be building fellowship, be it at your Rotary Club, be it in your own life, is it's gonna make you live longer. I bet you've heard a lot of speakers here and no one is making this promise to you, but this is the promise I make to you. If you take time to build fellowship, you're gonna be much happier and you're gonna live a lot longer. The University of California released a study in 2012 and they were looking at graduates over the age of 60. And they asked people if they felt connected, if they felt like they had good social ties out there in the world. And those who said no, who said they felt disconnected, actually had a 45% greater chance of dying before their alumni friends who said they felt connected. So your friends who don't belong to Rotary aren't gonna live as long as you. They're not gonna be as happy as you. So you wanna get the word out. You love your friends, right? So invite them to your clubs. Make them live longer like you're gonna live longer for being part of our group. Now, I can't guarantee that anything I've said today is gonna make you love building fellowship and connecting. If that's not your thing, and maybe it's not your thing. But if you just think about it as a skill set, something that you work on and something that you, you can learn and do better at, I think you're gonna find that fellowship can actually be a lot of fun. Not only can it be a lot of fun, but by pursuing a better approach to fellowship, you can be assured that you're building upon Rotary's great tradition of fellowship. This is our conference, our first conference in 1910 in Chicago. Here we are 105 years later in Brazil. I am absolutely certain that what Paul Harris did in starting Rotary and trying to build an organization of fellowship is going to be what ensures not only our survival, but why we thrive as an organization. And I don't know if the 250th Rotary Convention will be in Sao Paulo, but I know it's gonna be somewhere. Because if we work on fellowship, we can be absolutely certain that Rotary is not only going to continue to exist, but that it's going to thrive. And that is my wish for all of you. Go back, build fellowship, and thrive. Thank you very much for your time. I very much appreciate it.